Well, good morning. Welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. My name is Italo Furieri. I am the pastor here at Covenant Church. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I want to welcome you for being here this morning to worship God in the name of Christ. If you are a visitor with us, there are some visitor cards for you in the back. Make sure and fill one of those out. And then when the offering plate comes through during worship, you just put it in there and we'll have a record of your attendance here. And if we would like to contact you, we can do that. So please, if you would. Also, if you have any prayer requests, on the back of that visitor card, there is a place for you to put prayer requests. Just write your prayer request there if you want our elders to be praying for you. And also put it in the offering plate. Those prayer requests will make their way to us and we will pray for you. So uh, I think without any further, let me call your attention to the cover of your worship guide. There's a verse printed for you there to help you prepare for worship. And also there are handouts for the sermon with some blanks to fill in. You know, it's just a, a courtesy to you uh, with some, some, some help for during the sermon for you to uh, keep track of it so there's handouts for you in the back as well if you'd like to get those and uh, while we listen to the prelude let's prepare our hearts to worship please stand for the call to worship printed there on your worship guide we will read responsively praise the lord praise the lord O oh my soul i will praise the lord as long as i live i will sing praises to my god while i have my being put not your trust in princes in a son of man in whom there is no salvation when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O church. To all generations, praise the Lord. Father, God Almighty, our Father in heaven, we come to you because for the sake of your Son, Jesus, the King over all creation, the King of your kingdom, that in his name, his Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who testifies to us that we are your children and that he is the Lord, the Spirit who magnifies, who glorifies Christ, that He may be in our midst in a powerful way so that we would see Your kingdom come. And Lord, we ask for these things, even praying together that prayer which Your Son Himself taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Well, let us then rejoice in the presence of the Lord and sing together. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Our strength, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules over earth and heaven. The keys of death. Jesus give, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. He sits at God's right hand, till all his foes submit, and bow to his command. service that we give adoration to our king so let us pray father and our god we we thank you for the gift of your son that you've given us we we praise you in the highest of your heavens lord we see that the angels pray you saying holy 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 is the lord god almighty we worship you in this fashion lord we we understand that your sovereignty we thank you for your sovereignty for that sovereignty gives us comfort and peace, yet it humbles us to know that before creation began, you picked us out uh, among the world and made us your own, Lord. We thank you for all of that. Again, we thank you for sending your Son to save us, to give us mercy, to give us his righteous robe, that we may come before your presence, kneel before your throne, and give you thanks and praise and honor and glory. In Christ's name, amen. We'll be confessing our faith today from the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now our hymn, O Worship the King. Oh, worship the 
King, all glorious above, all gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O tell of His might, O sing of His grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunderclouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. The earth with its soul of wonders untold, almighty your power has founded of all. Established it fast by a changeless decree, and round it has cast like a mantle the sea. Your bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in you do we trust, nor find you to fail. Your mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. O oh, measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to him you above. The humbler creation, the feeble their late, with true adoration shall list to your praise. You may be seated. You guys know, right, that this is what's happening right now? You understand that what's happening right now is what we just saying here. While angels delight to him you above. You know, the word of God is to be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what's happening in heaven right now? The angels are singing. Because that's what gets done that constantly. And we just joined them. That's what we did. We are, we've joined the host of heaven. And we sang, we worshiped the king. Well, now... Now that we are properly humbled in his presence, we know that all we bring are petitions. We are children. We are sheep. So we're going to bring our petitions and supplications and intercessions now to our Father in heaven. Let's do that. Gracious Father, what will you do? What will you do? For your great name, Lord, we do ask you that you would do this for your great name. That you would pour out your spirit on all flesh and let the word of your son dwell richly even in our hearts. Be exalted, O Lord, among all the nations, among all the rulers and authorities everywhere, even in the invisible places, that your name would be exalted in the earth. Lord, be exalted. Be exalted above the heavens, that your glory would be all over the earth, and that we, as your image bearers, this is our, this is our request, Father, that we, as your image bearers, would shine forth your glory all over the earth. 
Lord, be exalted. Lord, we sing praises to you and to your power. Lord, we ask you to do great things for your glory with your heavy and strong arm. Our arms are feeble and weak and broken. Do not bring glory to us, Lord, but bring glory to you and to your name. We, like grass, wither, but you, you are eternal, the everlasting one. May your name, may your name be known forever. Lord, give us grace that we may walk in a manner worthy of this calling to which we have been called. Please multiply in us humility, gentleness, ah, patience, long-suffering, especially with one another. Help us to bear with one another in love, in kindness. Lord, it is in the name of your Son that we ask you all these things. We pray also, Lord, for the leaders of our church here, for our elders, for our deacons. Lord, would you continue to make them competent in Scripture? Would you continue to sanctify them, that they would keep in step with the Spirit, and that their lives would be filled with your Spirit? That there will be not an inch in their lives where your Word is not known. Lord, that you may equip them to do all the good work that you've called them to do. Help them, Lord, to be men of integrity, dignity, sound speech, men who, who are above reproach. Lord, please also uh, protect and bless those whom we support as missionaries. We pray in particular for Tim and Christy Holiday. We pray for Isaiah 55 and Reynosa, the work that they're involved in there. We pray for Marcus and for Heather Rudd who lead so much good work there at Isaiah 55. We pray in particular for Mario Hoca, who is the pastor there of the church that's being planted. Lord, would you bless that man's work for your glory. Lord, that Jesus may soon be known as the King of Reynosa. Lord, we pray for John and Kathy Clow in Honduras and for the work that they do there. And we pray also we pray also for Steve Henry, Lord, who helps missionaries amongst Muslim uh, people in Muslim countries, in hard places in the world. Lord, we pray also for Pastor Gama's church and his work in Edinburgh. Heavenly Father, in our midst, we have so many who are hurting and ailing and with needs. Lord, we have pains and suffering. Lord, you know... Because you did send your son and he experienced himself in the flesh all the weaknesses that we do. Oh, Lord, you know, have compassion on us. Will you give us respite? Will you help us? Will you heal us? Will you give us continued strength? Will you multiply our joy even in suffering because we have hope of eternal life? Lord, we do ask also for those in our midst who work and who have jobs and who need your provision. Lord, provide us our daily bread. Lord, I pray in particular for Eliud, who is looking for a job. Would you please provide for this man a job, Lord? You did tell us that in six days we would work and do all our labors. You want us to work. You want to provide to us through our jobs. So, Lord, give this man a job. Give us all provisions. Help us all in our work so that we would grow in thanksgiving to you and in generosity. Heavenly Father, we have no one to care for us except you. Therefore, we affirm that we are in very capable, good, loving hands. Help us not to fear, not to be anxious, but to trust in you at all times. Well, we pray this in the name of your Son, by whom we were adopted into your family. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved, let us confess then our sins that we may also receive forgiveness from God. We're going to read responsively there. It's a prayer. We'll pray together. 
alternating the lines. So it's a little different than what we usually do. So that's why I'm calling your attention to it a little more, okay? O merciful God, we humble ourselves before your holy majesty. We acknowledge that we have frequently and grievously sinned. We are unclean before you, O God, and deserving of death. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Be pleased to have compassion on us, our gracious God. Wash us in the pure fountain of Christ's blood, so that we may become clean and white as snow. Cover us with his righteousness and make us well-pleasing in your sight. To the glory of your holy name. Now, with your particular confessions, take your sins to God in silent confession. God never leaves us without assurance of God's forgiving grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is by grace through faith that we have forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. Well, let us stand let us stand and respond to that singing a hymn that you probably never heard before. It's called Amazing Grace. Praise, and when we first 
begun. Well, you may be seated. And if you would, please open your Bibles in the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, verse 27, chapter 9, verse 27. As we continue our journey through Matthew, you guys remember chapters 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, very known passage of Scripture. And after, Math, after the Sermon on the Mount, starting on chapter 8 and through chapter 9, Matthew takes us through nine miracle accounts. And Matthew was a very organized guy, very neat. And he organized these nine miracles in three groups of three each. And between each group, he put like a short intermission. And today, we see the final two miracles of all the groups, okay? And through these miracles, we have painted for us a very clear, unmistakable picture. A picture that says Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the one who had been promised to God's people. He is here. As the Messiah, Jesus has absolute authority. He has authority over diseases. He has authority over nature. He has authority over the invisible, the immaterial, the heavenly realm. He has authority to forgive sins. He has authority over death. He has power to bring people back from the dead. Therefore, he also has authority to remove all of the curse that sin has brought upon the world. All of it. So the climax of all these miracles was, was actually the last one that we saw. The one before, the one that we're going to read here, which was uh, Jesus' authority over death. And then with such a clear picture, you should be seeing clearly enough who Jesus is and what he came to do. And now Matthew turns his attention, begins to turn his attention on like, so who's ready now? Who's ready now to follow him? Who is ready to follow him? And these, fine, these miracles that we're about to read here, they're relatively simple compared to the other ones. You know, because once you have witnessed Jesus' power over diseases, over nature, over the weather, over death, these two right here, they're relatively simple. I mean, but... There's no, other, there's no parallel, actually, for these on the other Gospels. So Matthew is kind of emphasizing something here for us. This is Matthew's, you know, emphasis is on, the, it's on his passage, these two miracles. And what he's emphasizing now is, like, what are people seeing? What are people seeing with all that Jesus is doing? What are they seeing? Can they see? With all that Jesus is doing, what are people saying? What are they saying? So what are they doing? And what are they saying? If you're paying attention, you saw that that was the title, right, of the sermon. What are you seeing and what are you saying? And for those who would follow Jesus, that's the question. What are you seeing and what are you saying? So let's pray and then we're going to read. Heavenly Father, would you bless the preaching of your word? Holy Spirit, add your blessing to this. Let us hear your voice through your word, your inspired, inerrant, infallible word. Lord, uh, bless our time together here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So verse 27, chapter 9, let's read. And... As Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? 
They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this or about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man was, who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. Thus the reading of God's word. May its truth be written even in our hearts. So, by these two final miracles, by these two final miracles, the authority of Jesus over all creation is absolutely established. Absolutely established. And then, you, you, you caught that, right? Matthew doesn't even stumble, like he doesn't even stumble upon the, the healing of the mute. It's like, oh, by the way, the, the demon's cast out. You know, you know this. You know Jesus has authority over this. So the attention here is really on the range of responses. That's what the focus now turns to. The range of responses of people to Jesus. Your response to what you're seeing in the book of Matthew to Jesus. How much can you see? How much can you see? And in our passage here, what you have is like, you know, some who are blind, they are actually seeing stuff about Jesus. And some who think they are seeing, they're actually the blind ones. And it's what the passage does. It's, it's rather ironic how the passage is built like that. And that's still true, right? Today, some people, they can't see who Jesus is and they can't discern what he is doing. There are things here in this passage that we just read that the blind man, they see. And that's why they're following Jesus. They're blind, but they can see something. So they follow Jesus. They're physically blind, but they are seen. And the point of this passage is this then, if you'd like to take notes. Here's your first blank, okay? If you are going to follow Jesus, there are some things you need to see, and there are some things you will say. If you're going to follow Jesus, I mean, there's only two categories of people in the world. Only two. There are those who are following Jesus, and there are those who are not. This is probably not the best example, but you cannot be almost following Jesus just as you cannot be almost pregnant, for example. Either you are or you're not. Either you are following Christ or you're not. And if you are going to follow Christ, there are some things that you need to see. And when you do follow him, you're going to be saying some things. There are some things you will say. You're going to testify concerning what is it that you see about him. Because you're going to see and you're going to become an eyewitness. And then almost naturally, you're going to say what you see. So, what are you seeing about Jesus? What are you, what are you seeing and what are you saying about Jesus? Jesus. If you're going to follow him, there are some things you need to see, and there are some things you will say. And my goal for this sermon is really that you would reflect, that you would reflect on what is it that you personally are seeing about Jesus, and what is it that you are saying about Jesus. And upon reflection, if you are seeing these things about Jesus, well... If you are saying these things about Jesus, then I want you to follow really hard after him. And don't let anyone or anything stop you from following Jesus. 
So what, are you, what do you need to see? It's your next blank, our first point. What do you need to see? What do you need to see? Well, physically, these men, they're blind, but they were seeing a lot of things about Jesus, right? So how about us? How about you? What are you seeing about Jesus? Are you seeing, here's your next blank, Jesus' mercy. Are you seeing Jesus' mercy? Look at verse 27 again. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, and they were crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us. Matthew does not even tell us what it is that they are they're specifically asking for because Matthew thinks you're going to fill in the blanks. You know that what they want is to see. That's what they want because being a blind person, you know, it's quite a desperate situation. They don't see anything. They don't see. They live as you were in darkness. It's always dark for them. You know, someone who's blind, especially then, they are navigating through touch and groping and feel of tact. They, they could easily get lost. Someone could bump into them. They could bump into someone. They could trip and fall. You know, it's, it's precarious. So they, they need mercy. They know their condition is not a good one, so they cry out for mercy. I think that perhaps, if you go back a little bit on chapter 9, on verse 13, Jesus, perhaps they heard Jesus say, I want mercy, not sacrifice. I want mercy, not sacrifice. And for these men, they're like, that's great. Because what did blind people do back then? They begged. They don't have any sacrifice to give. They don't have anything. They come desperate, destitute. I need to receive. That's what, they're, that's what they're doing. And maybe you notice this, that Jesus does not immediately answer their cries. Jesus, as it is, like makes, he makes them follow him, like all the way to, to this house where he is staying. And this is just, this is just the return of a theme, isn't it? It's just a return of a theme that we've seen. No one may come to Jesus. No one may come to Jesus presuming that, that they are entitled to receive something. They come as beggars. They come asking for mercy. They come because they've seen he is merciful. They come to receive. They don't come giving. You don't come, you don't come to Jesus to give him something. You come to Jesus to receive mercy. If you see his mercy, then you follow him. You are a beggar. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with that condition? That's who you are. If you come to Jesus, if you see his mercy, you are a beggar. You're not special in that sense that Jesus is like, would you follow me? You are so special. You're a beggar. Like this blind man who can see. They can see Jesus is mercy. Physically blind, but seeing mercy in Jesus. You need to see that if you're going to follow Jesus. And then next, are you seeing, here's your next blank, are you seeing Jesus' kingship? Are you seeing Jesus' kingship? Kingship. In their cry for mercy, they cry out, Son of David, Son of David. Now, in the book of Ma in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the first time that son of David is found in someone else's mouth addressing Jesus. This is the first time Jesus is addressed in the Gospel of Matthew as the son of David. But we know that Matthew really, really, really likes that expression because his entire first chapter is about how Jesus is the son of David. He traces out his genealogy for us and he says, see, see, he is the son of David. So son of David is really important. And when people heard that, when people heard someone call someone else son of David, that was a big deal back then. That was a big deal. And Jesus is the son of David. Very strong expression. So what does it mean? What does this expression mean? Well, David, David was, he was the best king 
the greatest king in the history of Israel, bar none. The greatest king they ever had. He ushered God's people into their golden age. He was the best leader, the best warrior. He was the most courageous one. He went and fought all their enemies and subdued all of them. He expanded their territory. The, the kingdom of Israel was the greatest one during David's reign. That's when it expanded. Not only that, David, uh, David was a great writer and poet. He was a theologian. He was a prophet. Large portions of your Bible written by David wrote a lot of the Psalms. A lot of them still leads you into worship and prayer. That's David, the, the golden king. And during his reign, God made a covenant with him. You know, there, God called him the man after God's own heart. He was God's chosen king. So God made a covenant with him. He said, David, David, from your line, there will come a king whose reign will never end. David, one of your sons, will sit on the throne forever. And his kingdom will never end. So the son of David. From now on, everyone is like, who is the son of David? But David died. And his kingdom did end. As a matter of fact, as I like how a commentator put this, the golden age of David turned to bronze on Solomon's reign, his son. And then the bronze age of Solomon turned to rust on all his children after him. And it was completely shattered until its complete destruction in 586 AD by the Babylonians. But then, even still, God had prophesied that through the prophets. He prophesied that now, but you're still waiting for the son of David. Listen to this. This is from, Mike, from Amos, Amos chapter 9. I'm going to read it to you. This is a prophecy. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David. He's saying, look, in that day, like after everything goes downhill really hard, I'm going to raise up the booth of David that is fallen, and I will repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. By the way, I just thought about this. I said booth here. I don't want you guys here in Texas to think he's talking about cowboy boots. That's not what he's going to raise up again. A booth is a tent. It's the house. God is saying, I am going to again raise up the dynasty of David, even after complete destruction as it would be, as it would seem. So everyone is waiting for who? The son of David, the king. When he comes, he will be the last king. And he's going to reign forever. Well, the blind man, that's what they're seeing. They're seeing all of this in Jesus. He is the last king. He's the last one. And here's what's amazing. As they are seeing this, as beggars, Jesus does not yet look like much. Does he look like much? He doesn't look like much. Does he have an army? Does he, is, is he popular? I mean, maybe. Is he known beyond the borders of Israel? He doesn't look like much. That's okay, because that's exactly like David. That's exactly like David. Do you know that after David was anointed, he was anointed to be king, there was another king in power. It was King Saul. And King Saul, he saw David's popularity rising. So he became really jealous and began to persecute David to kill him. So David had to escape. And David escaped to hide in caves. So he, David went through a period of humiliation. Okay? And here's what happened during that period. Listen to this. I'm going to read it to you from 1 Samuel chapter 22. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now listen to this. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt 
And everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? That those that you you come look this is how you come to join the kingship of Christ even when things seem like they're very small and unassuming and the way you come is as I'm in distress I'm in debt I'm bitter in soul and I'm gonna go follow him I'm blind I'm begging and he will be king over you kingdom has begun that's that's what these men are seeing. You come under the kingship of Christ. Which is, by the way, clearly the most political thing that you can do. You want to do some political action. Start to make Jesus the king of every inch of your life. I think that the blind men are seeing this. I think they see all of this because, look at verse 28. Verse 28, when he entered the house, the blind man came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They call him Lord. They call him Lord. I think, and I guess, you know, I guess, look, I guess it's possible. I guess it's possible they're just being respectful. You know what I'm saying? I guess it's possible that they're just saying, yes, sir, sir, yes, sir, yes, mister. I think it's possible, okay? But it is so unlikely and inconsistent with the context as to be unbelievable, an unbelievable alternative. Because... They called him son of David. They believe him to be the Lord, the last king, the Messiah, the one who's going to sit on the throne forever. They must have known. They must have known passages like this one that you know. Listen to this passage from Isaiah. You know this passage. Look, listen. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. By the way, Everlasting Father in the sense of the king being a father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end, on the throne of David... On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will do this. And then what? You're going to call this guy Mr. <laughs> Sir? No. They're calling him Lord. He is the Lord. They are seeing his kingship. And you also have to think about this. Who does this? Like, who does this sort of thing? Who does this? Here's what they're doing. They are in the streets, in the midst of town, crying aloud. They don't even know what the guy who they're crying aloud looks like. Who does this stuff? The guy is not answering them. He's, they're just, I don't even know how they're following him. Somehow they figure, who does this? Who, is, who puts themselves through such humiliation and then follows him into a house? They don't even know what this house looks like. For all they care, for all they, care what, they don't know what this looks like. Who does this stuff? I tell you who does this. Someone who is seeing the kingship of Jesus. That's who does this stuff. Someone who sees it and they see it. Are you seeing, is this what you're seeing? The kingship of Christ over everything. So next, what are you seeing? Are you seeing Jesus' faithfulness? Are you seeing his faithfulness? Look at verse 29. Are you seeing Jesus' faithfulness? Then, verse 29, Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. 
and their eyes were open. According to your faith be done to you, and their eyes were open. Then he touched their eyes. Touched their eyes. Note this. I want you to note this. Physical touch. Physical touch is an element on many of Jesus' miracles. He touches people, okay? But when is the last time you let someone touch your eyes? I mean, that's, a ve- that's, a, as, that's about as intimate as he gets. Okay? I'm your pastor. Some, you know, not, you know, I don't hug everyone in here, but I'm a hugger. If you need a hug, just come talk to me. We'll hug, we'll hug it out. Okay? But I know some of you aren't huggers. You would, look, you'd feel pretty weird. If I said, hey, let me just touch your eye. But anyways, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. Who do you let touch your eye? I tell you who you let touch your eye. Someone who's faithful. Faithfulness is just, it's just a, it's a synonym of trustworthy. Someone who's trustworthy. Someone whom you say, I can trust him. I can trust this man to touch my eyes. I want you to imagine you're a blind person and someone just stick their hand in your eyes. This is what's going on. Trustworthiness. They they trust Jesus. They see his, they don't care. They can trust him. They can trust him. He is faithful. They can deposit their faith in him and not be disappointed. (laughs) He's going to do everything he said he's going to do. Your hope is secure in him. He's trustworthy. You are not going to be put to shame. According to whatever faith you deposited in him, you're going to probably receive more because your faith is just little. You just have little faith. He is faithful. He's trustworthy. He can be trusted. And for us, this is what this might mean to us. How intimate are you willing to let Jesus come? Like how intimately close are you willing to let Jesus come into your life? Is Jesus touching your eyes yet? Your sick eyes yet? Is Jesus that close? Are you letting him be that? How do you pursue that intimacy with Christ? That he is so close to you that he begins to touch these broken, hurt parts of you. Because you have those. You have those broken, hurting, sick parts of you. And And he can touch them. And he can heal them. But you're going to have to see his faithfulness. Because, you know, intimacy, just even just with someone touching your eyes, this can be uncomfortable. But this is what he does. He comes this close because he's faithful. And when you put your faith in him, he's trustworthy. He's not a betrayer. He's faithful. According to your faith. It will be done to you. Now, it is really fitting for me to make a comment here about faith. What, what is faith? What, what is this thing? What is faith? How do you get it, right? Because I don't want you to begin to think that faith is like a work that you do. You know, like you can turn on the the manifold of faith, like you get this handle of faith and you just turn it on like in a dynamo and you produce some faith and then now that you have faith in Christ, he owes you something because you have faith. That's not faith, okay? It's not a work. We just read that on our confession of sin and our assurance of pardon. We read from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we read this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Ah, see, see what the Bible is saying? It's saying like not even faith is your own doing. It is not your own doing. Even though you're the one who believes, it didn't come from you. It is the gift of God, is what the Bible says. It is not a result of works. Ah, boom! The Bible says faith is not a work. Faith is not something that you are doing. There's a good illustration of this. It's much better than anything I could write. It's like this. 
the faith which is in itself the faith which in itself is nothing is yet the organ for receiving everything keep listening to this it is the conducting link between man's emptiness and god's fullness and therein lies all the value faith has now look at this image for you faith is the bucket let down into the fountain or well of god's grace without which the man could never draw water of life from the wells of salvation and who gives you the bucket god and then he continues for the wells are deep and of himself man has nothing to draw with faith is the purse which cannot of itself make its owner rich the purse is nothing but who gives you the purse to hold the treasure in it god that's faith faith is like going to a restaurant and they serve you a beautifully deliciously cooked meal and then they say by the way here's a fork now get this fork it's faith and eat your food with it that's faith you receive it as a gift you use it and you grab hold of all that is in Christ because he's faithful once you put your faith in him according to your faith will be done and more according to your faith and more this is what is happening to them so you could say right if you're born without faith we're all born blind spiritually all born blind which is that metaphor here spiritual blindness no one can see unless christ touches their eyes unless god gives them eyes to see christ they cannot see if you can see jesus's mercy if you can see his kingship if you can see his faithfulness here's what happened to you god has touched you jesus has touched the eyes of your heart so that you can see and here's what else i can say to you if you are thinking even now i don't see but i want to see i want to see i don't see these things you know what you do you beg come begging have mercy of me son of david you know what he's going to do he will give you vision he will give you eyes to see so if you see what do you need to see you need to see these things and then once you see them i mean you follow him that's what you're going to do and then and then once you see and you follow him if you're going to follow him these are the things you need to see and there are some things you will say there are some things you you're just going to say there are some things you will say so here's the next blank our second point there what will you say what are you what will you say once you've seen jesus's mercy kingship faithfulness what are you going to say and the first thing we need to look at here is that even your simplest actions, even your simplest actions, they, they say a lot of things. They say something. So your next blank is this. Point A there on the second point is your actions will say something. Your actions will say something. So let's reflect on the actions of these people in the passage real quick. Let, let's take a look at the actions of the people in this passage. Look at the action of the blind men. Look at the action of the blind men. What, do, what does their action say? Look at verse 30b, the second part of 30. And Jesus sternly warned them. Sternly warned them. You know what that is? That's like he fiercely warned them. Okay, he, Jesus spoke severely with them. He, he almost like threatened them. And he said, see that no one knows about it. But, but they went away and spread his fame through all that district. Well, there is just no, I cannot make an excuse for these guys. Like, there's just no way to excuse such disregard for Jesus' kingship. You guys see that that's what's happening. They said, Lord, Lord. And then the Lord told them, here's what you're going to do or not do. 
And then what did they do? The opposite. So there's really no way to, to excuse them from this. I don't really want to waste your time trying to figure it out, like, why did Jesus not want them to say anything? Because it'd be my opinion. We don't know. We don't know for sure. I have, like, two favorite opinions, which I'm not going to waste your time with. But here's what's important for you and for me. Jesus told them, hey, don't do this. Do not do this. And then they went and did it. By the way, Jesus is not saying, no one can know. No, because of course some people are going to know. The people in the house knew. You're going to go home and you see, Mom, you look so beautiful. And your mother would say, ah, you can see me. Yeah, people would know. Okay? So Jesus is not saying that. But I don't think these guys understood the purpose of the command. It's like, I don't understand the purpose of this command. Second, I don't see, I don't really see the harm. I don't really see the harm in, you know, letting people know. I'm going to let everyone know. So, don't understand the purpose of the command. What's the harm in doing this? This is harmless. So, let's do it. Well, don't you see that in your life a little bit? You see that in your life. You know the commands of the Bible. You know the commands of Christ. There are some commands in your life that you don't understand. You don't know the purpose of them. There are some commands in your life that you really don't see the harm in disobeying. So it's like you. Before you get on your high horse and say, oh, I would never do this, you are already doing. Which is good. But this is good for you. Because you can see the mercy of God. Don't you? Do you think that that's all the gospel is? It just opens. The, the gospel just informs you of mercy. No. The gospel opens for you the way of mercy. What are these men supposed to do next when they figured out that they sinned? Repent. They know Jesus is merciful. Repent. And what are you going to get? Mercy. But repent. So, the actions, your actions, they say something. They say something. Next, look at the actions now of the people who are bringing to Jesus the demon-oppressed men. Look at verse 32. As they were going away, who is going away? The blind men. The blind men are going away. They're leaving the house. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute, was brought to Jesus. Literally there, literally in the, in the Greek, it says, it says simply, simply this. They brought to him a demon-oppressed man who was mute. They, who are they? We don't know their names. But what are the actions of these people saying to you? By the way, in chapters 8 through 9, Chapters 8 and 9, we have all of these people, all of these friends. We have all of these days, the day. They did this. They brought him. They did it. It's people bringing their friends to Jesus. People, come, to, come see Jesus. He will heal you. He will take care of you. He knows how to deal with your problem. Come to Jesus. Jesus can come to you. We're going to take you to him. The paralytic friends did that. We're going to take you to him. And here the same. Brought their friends to Jesus. Their actions say something. You need. Is that. Is that. Look. If you see all that stuff about Jesus. Shouldn't your actions be saying this? Your actions need to. I mean your actions. They would naturally say this. They would naturally say. I care about you. I'm going to take you to Jesus. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I'm going to bring you to Jesus. I don't know. I'm going to bring Jesus to you somehow, which is also happening in chapters 8 and 9. You've heard me say this. My, what I want is a friend who will always say, Italo, let's go to Jesus. Let's, 
go. Your actions say something. Then next, let's look at uh, the action of the man who was delivered and healed from his muteness. Let's look at his action. Look at verse 33, the second part. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. I don't know what he said. We don't know what he said. But let's, let's wander just for a little bit. Let's use our imagination. You are demon oppressed and then you speak. Because you couldn't speak, but now you can. What, what would you do? I like to imagine that he immediately started to just thank Jesus profusely. And then he probably, if he knew some psalms, he sang them. I think that was just came this, this stream of praises to God from his mouth. Something that might have happened is like, can I go tell everyone? And Jesus probably said, not yet. <laughs> you know, because the other guy, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what he said. But are we going too far? Because if, if blindness is a metaphor for spiritual blindness, if being paralyzed is a metaphor for spiritual paralysis, then muteness is a metaphor for something spiritual as well. And my prayer, beloved, my prayer is that all our muteness in this church would be cast out. That we would have a mouth to praise Jesus, to praise the Lord. That we would have a mouth to tell people the gospel. That we would let all the, that all the muteness would be gone. Because if, if we're going to use all these metaphors, then this is also a metaphor for something spiritual. Well, look at the action of this man. Once the muteness left, he spoke. What did he speak? Do you think he started to speak about the weather? Do you think he began to speak about the game, the sports, the, the Roman Colosseum, politics? That's all he talked about? Oh, I've been wanting to tell you about that game for so long. He, no. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about God. Praising God, thanking God, making him known, whatever. He was mute. So look at his action. Your actions, they say something. And next, look at this other one. The action of the crowd. The action of the crowd. The crowd marveled. Look at verse 33. The second part of verse 33. The crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. Now that's perplexing for the crowd. Because if never was anything seen like that, if Jesus is so special, right? Why don't they follow him without reservation? Meaning, why don't they follow him without any fear of loss in their lives? Why? We know they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. Not too long after this event, you know what they're going to do? They're going to be singing, crucify him. We've never seen anything like this in Israel, so let's kill him. Is that, does that make any sense? There's people like that in the church. There's people like that in your neighborhood. They think Jesus is special. They'll say, never was anything like this ever seen. But are they following Jesus without any reservation? No reservation. There's no part of their lives which is not under the kingship of Christ. Beloved, if you see Jesus' mercy, I'm here to tell you. There are parts of your life who had been or are still not under the kingship of Christ. So follow, if he's so special, follow him. Bet the farm. Bet the whole farm. The crowd, they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. We're going to get to that part in the book of Matthew. But then, you have a mouth. You have a mouth. So it's not only your actions that speak, but also your mouth confesses. So if you see these things about Jesus, what are you going to say? Here's your final blanks there. You will be ready to say this. 
you are going to be ready to say this. Jesus is exactly who he says he is. I will follow him. You're going to be ready to say this. This is what you will say if you see these things about Jesus, which happens to be the exact opposite of what the Pharisees are saying, right? The Pharisees say the exact opposite of that. If you look at verse 34, but the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. Do you want to know what it's like to be spiritually blind and spiritually mute? Here it is. That's it. That's what it looks like. The Pharisees cannot see anything about Jesus. They cannot confess. As a matter of fact, they are against him. And what they confess is the opposite. Instead of saying, he is the king of heaven. He is the king of God's kingdom. What they say is, he is working for hell. That's what he's doing. That's the picture that they see. Because they're blind. And they are mute. But then we come around. Listen. We come around full circle now. This is incredible. Now we come around full circle because... Look at verse 35. This is not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. Look at verse 35. What is Jesus going to do? These are, all, these are blind people. And you see what they just said. They just call him basically like, you're not even Satan. You're just a demon. <laughs> Look, verse 35. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues. What? And proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. You see what Jesus is going to continue to do? Because he is merciful. What is Jesus going to continue to do? He's going to continue to go to them. He's going to continue to say, come to me. Will you come to me? I'm merciful. Come to me. I will forgive your sins. Repent from this. You may come. Jesus is going to continue to do that. And they will have a chance to repent. The window is going to close. But they will have a chance to repent because that's who Jesus is. He is merciful. He is faithful. He is the king. He is their king. I think Paul, I'm going to close with this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, 26. What Paul learned from Jesus, he is now giving it to Timothy. This is what Paul tells Timothy. Timothy, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but kind to everyone. He must be able to teach, patiently enduring evil. That's Jesus. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. That's what Jesus does. God may perhaps grant his opponents repentance. Maybe. Leading the, his opponents to a knowledge of the truth, which they don't have. And... Paul says, they may come to their senses. That's exactly what Paul says. Maybe they will gain vision. Maybe they will gain their speech back. And they'll be able to see Christ. And they'll be able to confess Christ. That's what Jesus is going to continue to do. That's who Paul learned from. He learned from your Lord. From Jesus. And then, when they come to their senses, they will escape from the snare of Satan. Of the devil because they have been captured by him to do his will that's Jesus' ministry continued on verse 35 do you see like do you see Jesus' mercy his kingship his faithfulness if you do then follow him say those things confess him follow him Say all that stuff with, with your actions. Don't let anything stop you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the immeasurable grace, this amazing grace that we've received in him. Lord, that we, ha that we may have sight to see these things. Lord, that you may be the one to give us vision and that your son, Father, may be our vision.
and that we may follow him without anyone stopping us. In his name we ask. Amen. Well, let us stand then and respond to the preaching of the word of God. Sing, Be Thou My Vision. vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to be saved that Thou art, Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my light. Be Thou my wisdom and Thou my true word, I ever with Thee and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I Thy true Son, Thou in me dwelling and I with Thee one. Be Thou my battle shield, sword for my fight. Be Thou my dignity, Thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, I my high tower. Praise Thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. My King of heaven, my treasure thou art. My King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach Heaven's joys, O bright Heaven's sun. Lord of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler. be seated and we'll continue with our worship now with the giving of the tithes and the offerings in obedience thanksgiving in worship to god and this is some of the things that we do here at covenant presbyterian church we need you to be praying for the session meeting this tuesday by the way those meetings are public okay so if you'd like to come and see what the elders of the church do you can come and attend that session meeting. We're going to meet here at 4 p.m. on this Tuesday. And then the following uh, Friday, now this Friday, sorry, this Friday and this Saturday coming, uh, there's also the Presbytery meeting, so I'm the only one who's going to go to that Presbytery meeting. Presbytery is the meeting of all the regional churches, all the pastors and elders. We meet together, and we have some business that we have to do together. And that's where we're going to go. I'm going to go to San Antonio, and every quarter we have a presbytery meeting. So be praying for that, that I go back there safely, come back, and, and pray for all of us who are going to be there. Also, parents, youth, church, South Texas Presbytery Youth Camp is coming up February 17th to 20. We do have a group from here that's going to that. It's only for high school students, so middle schoolers, you know, that's not for you yet. It's for high school students only, so parents, be on the lookout for communications on that. If you need any other information, please contact Mary. She's helping us get that together. And then there's an announcement there for the uh, Women's Conference coming up in April. Women of Purpose Conference, annual conference. They meet every, ap every April, every year. And it's going to be meeting in New Braunfels, Texas. The registration is open now, and the deadline is April 1st. 
Uh, early registration, you know, the information is there. I don't want to bore you with reading all of it again, but if you need any information on that, you contact Lisa. She's got the ropes on that, and she's going to help you go. So I want to encourage the women to attend this. It's always a good uh, opportunity for you guys. So without any further, let me pray in thanksgiving, and we'll conclude. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Without you, we wouldn't have any food. We wouldn't have any bread. We would have nothing. But you, Lord, you sustain the summer and the fall and the winter and spring. And you give us all these gifts. We receive them from your hand. Oh, Father, will you please, by your mercy, continue to take care of us. Also, Lord, that we may always have generous hearts, thankful hearts, loving, charitable hearts, that we may always support your work and those who are in need. Bless us in that way. In Jesus' name. Let us stand then and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.